Welcome to Triumphant Spirit, America's World War II Generation Speaks. This program is a series of broadcasts featuring the stories of a generation that fought and won the Second World War. No matter how they fought the war or where, on the home front or the battlefield, each veteran featured on the program contributed valiantly to a victory that changed the 20th century. Here are their stories in their own words. They are stories of actions and deeds that not only helped shape the outcome of the war, but the very world we live in today. Responsible for setting up training centers, constructing fortifications, clearing obstacles, and building bridges during a theater of war with the U.S. Army's combat engineers. Combat engineers not only trained to accomplish their primary missions, but also trained as infantrymen as their tasks often carried them into the face of battle. One combat engineer battalion that earned a presidential unit citation for valor as a infantry unit was the 254th Engineers, a Michigan National Guard unit. During the Battle of the Bulge, the battalion helped hold the north shoulder of the Bulge, thereby limiting the spread of the German counterattack. After the Battle of the Bulge, the 254th distinguished itself again by building the longest tactical bridge across the Rhine River. They did it in record time, 14 hours, enabling the U.S. 5th Corps to swiftly move into Germany. Joined the 254th after it was deployed to England in 1942 was a young combat engineer, Richie Goff, a truck driver from New Jersey. I wanted to go in the Air Force, but they put me in the engineers. And I was a little reluctant when I first went in, but after a while, I'm glad I did. I, I really enjoyed it. Rich, did you volunteer or were you drafted? I was drafted in May 43. Went to Fort Belvoir, the engineer camp, 13 weeks of basic. Uh, went out to Shenango, Pennsylvania for a week or so. And Shanks, New York, and then over to England on the Queen Elizabeth. When at basic training, what was life like? Good. We were right outside of Washington for one thing. We get passes into Washington, but uh, the training was very good. We took more extensive training in England, though. But uh, the basic training, aside from marching, that was mines, demolitions, bridge building, you know, whatever. But I enjoyed it. How did your family feel about you possibly going overseas into combat? What, what did you tell them? Well, I had stopped home at about two days before I did go over because we're at Shanks, so I could come down into Newark. So I told him I was going. I said, I don't know where I'll be, you know. I'll probably go to England. I'm not sure because we're going out of New York. I didn't know where, really, where we were going. So I said, all I can do is write and let you know. So, of course, the invasion wasn't then. I was, this was September of 43, and yeah. Uh, D-Day wasn't until 44, so I guess they figured if I didn't go to North Africa, you know, I would be safe for a while anyway. When you rode home, what did you write home about? Oh, the training and that there. Of course, all the letters were censored, you know, and I couldn't say where I was, but I said every, everything was fine. I was being treated well, like good food and <laughs> everything else, so no problem with that. That's while I was in England. When I was in France, I... I didn't write when uh, we were assigned as infantry. I didn't write. I didn't want them to worry extensively, you know. They were worried enough. So I just told them, you know, what I had seen like that. Like I was always behind the lines so to, that they wouldn't be constantly worried. But I guess their prayers of mine was a big help because somebody answered them. <laughs> and I come through it out of scratch, so... That was one good thing. Rich, when in England, the mission of your unit, the 254th Combat Engineers Battalion, was to build an assault training center, which the British and American troops used uh, to train for the invasion that was going to unfold yes. on D-Day, 6th of June. Tell us what that was like, and how did the training go? We were at Torquay, and I think as part of Slapton Sands Assault uh, Training Center, 
We laid out a minefield. I guess the beach was about a mile and a half long. We laid out a minefield with barbed wire. And uh, then they evacuated us up out of the way, and they shelled it the first time to see what the, the damage would be if on an assault. We didn't see no troops come in. They just shelled it just for the effect. When that was over, we picked up the mines, straightened the barbed wire out again, and relayed the mines, and then they bombed it. And we left after that. I don't know what they'd done. I understand the 82nd Airborne moved into them, that hotel that we were in. But as far as the beach went, I don't know what they'd done with it, you know. How did your unit train for D-Day? And when in France, did you consider your training adequate in the face of battle? I think it was, and I think uh, our outfit anyway had good leadership. It had been a Michigan engineer outfit, and they were mobilized January of 42, and they were shipped to Ireland to set up barracks and uh, depots for supplies coming over. So they had good training. They have been in the National Guard, and they were, you know, they knew their work. And when I went into the outfit, I guess half of them were the veterans of that, that outfit, and the other half were the fellows that come in as replacements. So we had good leadership. I think we did very good. When in France, when did you first experience combat? Uh, the night of D-Day. We went in, they told us, they sent one platoon in at 6 o'clock or 6.30 for uh, a vanguard for the 5th Corps. And then uh, we went in later, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the afternoon. By that time, the, the beach, the, most of the men were off the beach. And we moved up to uh, what they called the file, a defile. And the first night I spent up on the plateau, which I believe is the cemetery now. And uh, I was all right when I was with somebody, but when I got in the foxhole by myself, I, I was shaking so bad, I thought I was cold because I was sweating. <laughs> but it was fear, and I, I uh, froze from the waist down. I don't know how long it lasted. I don't know whether it was 10 minutes or an hour. I, don't, I couldn't move. I could move my arms and that, but I couldn't move my legs. I just laid there, so. After that experience, what, what did happen? Did someone discover no, your condition? No, I was all right, no. You were all right. The next morning, I was all right. Yeah. It was self-recovery. I think so, but it was just fear that overcame me. The next morning, Rich, did you ever look back on the beach? And if you did, you did. Can you recall what you saw? Well, there was bodies on the beach, prisoners. They were still shelling the beach. The small arms fire had been over with because they were pushed back. The Arkansas was still firing their broadsides and the rocket ships. They used LCTs with uh, rockets on. They were still firing inland over us. How far inland, I don't know. And our job was to pick up mines, clear the roads, and fill in any holes so, you know, the tanks and the mobile stuff could move. After you moved away from the beach, they got involved in Hedgerow Company, uh, country. Yes. What was the experience of the unit in, in the hedgerows? Bad. It, they didn't have no way of getting through the hedges. They tried blasting them with their 75s, the tanks, and it wasn't effective. And they started using two engineers on a tank with satchel charges and lay it against the hedgerow and blow it. The tank went through and machine gunned the next hedgerow because they were great, the Germans were great for putting machine gun nests on both ends. They put tracers in one that fired high and putting the regular bullets in the other one. So if you ducked down, you got hit anyway. So they had you coming and going. But you'd get the next head roll and do the same thing. Blow it, get off the tank, put two uh, charges down, satchel charges. It'd back off, blow, and then they'd run the tank through it. Fortunately, I wasn't assigned to any of that, but that's what they were doing. After you left Hedgerow Country in Normandy, what was its next mission? Well, 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 I guess when the hedgerows were still there, we hit the Veer River, and they had a flooded plain, 
and there was no way for the tanks or anything to get across that. They used weasels to get men over there. And uh, we put up four sections of treadway. There was four culverts blowing up. And we put treadway bridges there so the tanks could get through. And we also put a Bailey Bridge on uh, the Veer River so they could join up with the 4th Infantry coming from the other side of Point de Hoc. So in, the other, in other words, the two fronts could join into one. Your unit participated in the Battle of the Bulge, which took place later in the, the year 1944, December 1944 to be exact. Can you recall the first day you encountered the Germans and what did you see? How did you feel and what were your reactions? Well, they got us up around 12 o'clock at night. We were behind the 99th Division. I don't know how far they were extended across the front line, but they were spread thin. We were basically about 600 men combat, the rest were headquarters. And they said, you're gonna back up the 99th if you can stop the Germans, if they break through. It seemed kind of odd to me that the division had like 14,000 men infantry, and there's 800 men going to stop somebody that comes through 14,000. But uh, we did hold Piper off for uh, nine hours. You referred to Piper. Who was Piper? Piper was uh, SS Colonel of the 1st uh, SS Panzer Division. He came into Bell Bulletin, and uh, we held him off for nine hours. He had two assaults, infantry assaults, and we beat them back. We didn't have no equipment aside from the rifles and machine guns, a couple of bazookas, but when we pulled out so quick, we left all the landmines, demolitions, primer cord, TNT, whatever, back at the, where we were, bivouacked. And uh, they pushed us back out of Bulletin to Buchenbach, but that nine hours gave the 1st Infantry and the 99th time to come down and hold the north shoulder, which was Elsenborn Ridge. And that's where we fell back to. Rich, in the face of battle, what do you remember most? Being scared, for one thing, it, it never left me. You know, every, every time that we were assigned as infantry, that feeling come up. And you hate to see your friends get hit or die. But then you have mixed feelings. Down deep you say, I'm glad it wasn't me. You don't like to feel that way, but it's the way you feel, you know, you can't help it. At least I couldn't, I don't know about anybody else. I, maybe it's self-preservation, I don't know. As the Germans advanced, did you ever see them face to face, yes. up close? Well, two or three hundred yards maybe, maybe a hundred yards, you know. And uh, his tanks come up, Piper's tanks come up, and when he hit, he hit us with the infantry, we drove them back, because we didn't have nothing to fight the tanks, nothing whatsoever, really. And uh, they gave us two infantry assaults, and we beat Bolton back the third one, though he used the tanks. And he got in the bulletin and got gas. But with our efforts, as I said, the first and uh, the uh, 99th come down, and he had to turn southwest instead of going northwest to get up to Antwerp. And between us, the 99th Infantry engineers and a couple other engineer outfits and the 291st, Piper got so frustrated and he called them the damn engineers every time he turned around. The engineers were doing something. And the last one was when they blew the bridge up in front of uh, Choice Point. I believe that's the name of the town, and he had nowhere to go, only back. During the course of period of time that you're talking about, Rich, the Malmody Massacre took place. Yes. 115 American GIs were herded into a field. The Malmody Massacre took place. Yes. 115 American GIs were herded into a field. They were machine gunned. Of the 115, 86 were killed. Did you hear about that during the course of battle? And if so, yes. what was your that, reaction? That spread like wildfire, and the reaction was no prisoners. It wasn't an official, you know, coming down from headquarters, don't take no prisoners, but the men felt that way. No prisoners for what reason, Rich? 
were them shooting the prisoners that we had. Your unit was responsible for building in 14 hours the longest tactical bridge over the Rhine after the Battle of the Bulge. Could you tell us about that? Well, before that, we were down in Luxembourg. We liberated Luxembourg, which on the 50th anniversary, I got a medal from them for the liberation of it. That was the first time they were liberated. The bridge across the Rhine was, well, it would be upstream, upstream from the Remagen Bridge near Cologne. And uh, we did build it in 14 hours, the longest tactical bridge in the world. And as far as I know, that record still stands. It's a floating treadway, pontoon bridge. We done it in 14 hours, and we could have done it a little bit sooner if the bridging equipment had come a little quicker. But you're waiting Peter to pay Paul, you know, so. But we got the unit citation from that, from the president. No, um, I'm sorry, that was the Battle of the Bulge. But that was the longest bridge. And uh, I guess they had, must have ended up having maybe four or five bridges. I know Patton had one or two in the Third Army. We were still in the First Army yet. And that's about the height of it. All right. As you were building that bridge, can you describe for our viewers how events unfolded? Well, we put the pontoons in the river and the Treadway hooked them to them, and then they took them out by uh, small boats and hooked them up. It was assembled on near shore, and then went out, hooked up, another one be assembled, went out and hooked up. They had three or four Navy boats, small ones, pushing against the bridge all the time on account of the flow downstream. I don't know what the rate of the river was flowing, so many feet per second or a minute. They had, uh, inch and a half cable, inch and a quarter cable strung across the river, which they found luckily, and they had sea anchors out. And uh, it used to be nice to stand on the pontoon and watch the tankers come because the weight of the thing put the pontoon down deeper in the water. And so all I could see was the rest of the bridge up in front of them as they rolled along. It had come up behind them again. So, I mean, just look at their face, you know, looking at the water, getting closer. Not like you go across a regular bridge and you know it's 10 feet down. It, but this year was getting closer as they went out, you know, further in the river. Because naturally the pontoons are weaker out there, you know, with the length of the bridge. But it was a good experience building. Rich, having experienced the Battle of the Balls, when in Germany, what was your attitude toward the Germans, not the military, our, but the civilians? I didn't run across that many civilians. It, basically, I, I, we run across more displaced persons, DPs, what they call them, that were freed from the infantry in front of us. I mean, we weren't always on the front line, you know, as infantry. We'd done a lot of work, service work in the back roads, you know, picking up landmines and stuff like that. And we run across a lot of them people. German civilians, uh, you know, we weren't supposed to fraternize anyway, so we more or less ignored them, you know, unless you needed directions or something or information. Your generation sacrificed much to win the war in Europe. Would you do it again if another war broke out? I'm glad I'd done it then, but I don't know whether I'd be apprehensive, I think, about doing it again. You know, if I knew what I was going to go through, I don't know whether I would want to or not, really. Could you elaborate on that, Rich? Is that because of what you, what you saw? Is it because of what you experienced? Probably, if I didn't know, I think I would, I would go in again, you know, but if I was younger, I would go in again because I wouldn't have that experience in front of me or, you know, behind me, whichever. In Saving Private Ryan, a dying captain played by Tom Hanks tells Private Ryan to be a good man before the captain dies. Rich, were you a good man? You'd have to ask somebody else about that. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I wouldn't want to blow my own horn, really. I think I'd done what I was supposed to do. I try to be good, you know, but other people might have a different impression of me. I have no idea. Rich, I think I can answer that question, and the answer is you certainly were. Thank you. Do you have anything to say to today's generation? If, 
If the United States is in trouble like they were then, go ahead and, you know, don't be a draft dodger or anything. I mean, that, that was one time the whole country came together as a unit. There was very few slackers or people, you know, wanted to get out of it. The whole country did stick together. Since then, every, every combat we had, every war we had, the, the country didn't stand behind it. The, I don't know whether the morals or whatever it was, you know, but it's not there no more. The unity or the pride. I was proud to be in. I was proud to come home. I got a good rep, you know, uh, reception when I come home. I know the fellows from the Vietnam War didn't, which was unjustified to me. They were drafted. They went, they done what the country told them, and they come home and they weren't treated at all. Rich, when you came home, did you talk about your experiences to anyone? My father, because I was in some of the same sections he had been in during World War I. So he was with this Lightning Division, 78th Lightning Division. And uh, we could relate a couple of the towns, you know, that he'd been through and where he was. I didn't talk to my mother too much. She didn't like nothing to do with guns or anything else or... In fact, when I had the one hanging in the closet and she opened the closet, she said, I'll never go in that closet again. <clears throat> right. In 1945, Stars and Stripes published in Europe an article that I'm, I'm showing you now. Yes. It's entitled Lady in White. It makes reference to the fact that your unit uh, was a unit that was involved in this dog. incident. Could you describe the incident and tell us a little about what, what you saw? Wallendorf was one of the first towns to be entered by American troops on the Siegfried Line in Germany. And we had put a bridge at the bottom. And we were getting harassing fire from the top, you know, machine gun fire occasionally. And uh, Lieutenant S. he said, I want somebody to go down with a stretcher, two men to go down with a stretcher. Because he had gotten a report that somebody got hit down there. So I said, I'll go. And this friend of mine I always hung around with, Moose Berry from... Uh, Maine, he was a big guy. I figured I'd hang with him. If a sniper was going to take a shot at somebody, I figured he'd take the bigger of the two of us. You know? But anyway, him and I went down, and I, I grabbed my rifle, and he said, where are you going with the rifle? The lieutenant, I said, down with the stretcher. He said, no, you're a you know, medic. I said, no, I'm not. I have nothing on my helmet. And when I went down to the bridge, fortunately, we come back empty-handed. There was nobody wounded down there. But I got a glimpse of this woman in the field. And I didn't think much of it. I just thought it was a civilian out there in the field, which occasionally you did see them. But then later on, we found out she was directing artillery. As troops come along the, down the road, you know, marching at night, she'd walk out there and they'd start firing. She'd move two steps to the left. They'd move maybe two, two yards or a hundred yards a step. I don't know. But in the night, was, how did the Germans see her moving? They could probably see her, but they couldn't see the bridge. She could see the bridge. She was in the middle, like German, the spotter was here, the gunner was here, she was here, and the bridge was here. But that was, they were up, at, Wollendorf was up on the side of a mountain, so they probably couldn't see right down onto the bridge. So she was a spotter for it. The one guy machine gunned her, so he said, and she disappeared into the woods, but nobody ever found her, so whether she got wounded or whether she went someplace. Maybe she didn't even get hit, I don't know. But she was the lady in white. Mm -hmm. And that's how she was seen and in the evening And I don't know how old she was because she was a distance away, but I could see her, you know, the shape that it was a woman with a long gown on, like a house coat or a gown, you know, nightgown or whatever. And that's the last I heard of her. <laughs> but later on, that town was leveled because the Germans counterattacked and they took the bridge. We were out of there then. By then, it was the 5th Armored Habit then. But when they got it back again and they went into the town, they put out white flags. And when they got up on top of the hill, they started shooting at them. So they leveled the town. The Americans leveled the town. And then all the white flags were out, and then the people started shooting at them. So. Do you recall any other stories that you'd like to relate? Not that I know offhand. Well, we did. We ended up in Pilsen, Czechoslovakia, 
And that's the home of Pilsner beer, and it was the Skoda Gun Works. Of course, the engineers had to liberate that. And the engineers always used white tape when they sealed off a minefield. So we put it around these buildings so nobody could come into the brewery <laughs> and did the gun works. But we, had, we ended up having German prisoners. We restored the waterworks and most of the streets, you know, as far as the rubble went, filled in the potholes. And then the war ended, which I was glad to hear. And they, the lieutenant that we had, he said to me, you're going to Asia. I said, are you going through the States? He said, yes. I said, you ain't going to see me. I served my time. <laughs> but of course, I couldn't have done nothing about it anyway. But they brought us back up into um, France, and we built Camp Miami. These are uh, deparkation camps for troops moving back with points. They would come there right outside of La Havre, and they came there. Then I had enough of points to come home, and I come home, and I got a good reception when I come home. The only thing was, I wasn't 21 yet, two months shy. I couldn't drink, couldn't vote. But I could score. <laughs> I could spend time in Europe, but I couldn't, I couldn't do the good stuff at home. So I had to wait till February to drink <laughs> and to vote. So, and I went back to my, well, my father had a trucking business, and I went back to work, and I didn't have to look for a job. I knew where one was. About 31 months, 32 months in, but I think it was well spent. <laughs>